for as long as a hundred of us remain alive, never will we, on any conditions, be subjected to the lordship of the English. It is in truth, not for glory, nor riches, nor honors, that we are fighting, but for freedom alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. ago here in Arbroath Abbey. A diplomatic letter was signed and sealed by Scotland's barons along with the country's iconic leader King Robert the Bruce. It was a plea for recognition of Scotland as a country and famously declared an idea for the first time in words that people are above kings. It's certainly one of the most significant documents to come out of the British Isles, if not Western Europe in the Middle Ages. This is the earliest European assertion of the right of a nation to self-determination. What it was as an achievement was absolutely magnificent and places Scotland in the centre of European intellectual traditions and political traditions at that time and in, and in some ways a leader. In a carpenter's attic in Aberfeldy, a package has arrived from Edinburgh. It's a new tapestry, inspired by the Declaration of Arbroath. Angus Ross has designed a special frame, but it's the first time he's seen the tapestry. So, will it fit? With a global pandemic shutting down society, this artwork could be the only memorial to the Declaration on its 700th anniversary. But then, its true significance in Scotland's story has been overlooked and contested for centuries. Bannockburn, the victory much celebrated by Scots, brought a temporary truce between the warring thrones of Scotland and England, but not peace. In 1316, at the tail end of a mini ice age, crops failed, hunger was rife, and resentment too. as soldiers were fed before locals. One year after Bannockburn, we get the beginnings of the Great European Famine across Northern Europe, um, which claimed as many as 10% of the population of Northern Europe, more in some areas. Um, and that, mean, that partly leads, leads to military stalemate. In a context of food shortages, of failed harvests, it's very difficult to put large armies in the field. So this means, in the first instance, that the English king cannot retaliate. Edward II, I'm sure, the first opportunity would have liked to be back up in Scotland with an army to wipe out the stain of Bannockburn. In 1298, Edward I does the same thing. He responds to the defeat at Stirling Bridge the following campaigning season. But Edward I is unable to do this, probably partly because of these environmental problems. Bruce is unable to push for a victory for partly the same reasons a military victory. So diplomatic means are the, the most effective route by 1320 in the middle of what is essentially an ecological crisis. This is Bannockburn House, built in the Jacobite era, bought recently by the community. A fitting place for a controversial idea that Bruce was not just fighting the climate, but also his own warrior belief that Edward could be beaten into submission. Surely not unreasonable after a victory as resounding as Bannockburn. In many ways for Bruce, it's a failure. I hate to say this, I know, <laughs> I'll be shot for that. Um, it is a failure in the sense that it does not end the war because Edward II is at least as stubborn as his father. He will not give up any of his rights 
unless he has to. And Bruce hasn't made him do it. He's humiliated him. He's shown that the Bruce as the Scottish king is the military power in the British Isles and, and even Ireland. Um, but, uh, but he has not brought Edward to acknowledge Scottish independence and Bruce as king. And for that, that's, that, that, there's no negotiating about that for Bruce. Um, so that's really what we're talking about in the years leading up to the Declaration, is this, this kind of um, block between the two kingdoms. Um, the, neither side have things that they will budge on. For Bruce, it's Scottish independence and his right to be king. And for Edward, it's his right to rule Scotland. So they have an impasse. And into that mix is thrown the Pope or he throws himself, because the Pope wants a crusade, as Popes do in this period. The Holy Land has been taken uh, from the Christians, and to do that, he needs the Christian nations of Europe to stop fighting each other, as they have a tendency to do, particularly Scotland and England, and put their energies into the crusade. International intrigue and a battle of wills, nothing new there. But what fascinates me is that Bruce and the barons finally knew when it was time to turn from the battlefield to the power of the pen. Persuasion, canny pressure, clever arguments, powerful words were needed to get Scotland recognised as an independent kingdom with Robert the Bruce, its uncontested king. Back then, the Catholic Church was the supreme adjudicator of disputes in medieval Europe, and its leader was not happy with the Scots. The Pope had excommunicated Bruce three times, once for killing a rival, and summoned him for a dressing down several times, in vain. So the whole of civic Scotland was facing shutdown under a papal interdict to stop official ceremonies, even like marriage. Bruce had infuriated the Pope, so King Robert turned to the only folk able to fix that. There's nobody in Scottish society in the days that was more integrated into the kind of European power networks than the clergy. You know, this is, we're standing in the biggest, well, one of the biggest ecclesiastical buildings ever built in Scotland. This place had European significance and the folk that worked here were part of a European network. They had way more experience than some local Tuchter baron at dealing with European power structures, you know. So when it came to getting recognition of Scotland's ancient independence for the Pope, you needed the clergy on side, and the clergy were very much on side. The clergy weren't just the go-betweens between Robert the Bruce and the Pope. They were also the ones that helped form the message. They knew what language to use. They knew how to phrase the arguments and they also had huge experience in this. Perhaps another factor was pushing Bruce towards peace. His brother Edward died in battle, leaving Robert without an obvious heir. Exactly the same kingship crisis that started those English incursions 30 years earlier. Bruce was ageing, and suddenly Scotland might be up for grabs again. So three letters were written to the Pope, only the last remains, now known as the Declaration of Arbroath. Written in Latin, it carries the seals of Scotland's barons to give the impression of solidarity and unanimous support. Well, Bruce wrote it, essentially. Bruce's regime the, wrote the Declaration of Arbroath. It's their, their production. It's in the name of the barons, but only, only in a sense of it, in, in a symbolic sense. So we, don't, we do not have a document here in which a group of barons sat round and constructed it. They attended their seals to it and they were probably expected to agree with the sentiments. But the Declaration of Arbroath is a, is a product of Bruce's regime. The document beseeches the Pope to pressure the English to talk peace and lays out the reasons why Scotland should exist as an independent kingdom. I think they just decided what we need to do is, is, is get our martial our arguments, create bullet points effectively of, of, of why it's 
England that's in the wrong and why the Pope needs to do something about it. It needs to stop England because England's done very well in the recent past in, in persuading the, the Pope to, to move against King Robert. So this is really the Scottish response. And there hasn't really been a Scottish response. There have been a couple of delegations, but this is the big one. But they've been busy. Uh, this is them saying, OK, we, we really do need to deal with this now, but we're not going to deal with it the way the Pope wants. We're just going to write this letter, show the unity in Scotland, which actually doesn't exist really, <laughs> well, there's serious cracks in that unity, um, but present that to the Pope saying all of Scotland, is our, all the Scottish nobility are arguing this. This is the King's propaganda, the King's version of Scotland's history. I mean, some of it is, is generic and is building on what the Scots have said for a long time or a reasonably long time, uh, but a lot of it is addressing that fundamental problem, which is that Robert Bruce is a usurper a murderer and a usurper. You don't forget that when you live in those times. If it can make it to the next generation, it'd be fine, but he lives with that. Um, so he has to present Scotland's history in a way that supports Bruce's right to be on the throne. It's a diplomatic letter, but amongst the poetic language and imagery, there's even a veiled threat. If the Pope doesn't intervene, he'll be responsible when war kicks off again. We expect this kind of diplomatic um, correspondence to be extremely formal um, and it does start off that way um, but by the end of the letter it becomes the, the tone changes a little bit and it does say to the Pope um, if you do not help us then whatever happens next will be your fault um, which is quite a risky thing to say but it's also quite a brave thing to say. The Scots knew that their letter had to stand out it had to have a sense of urgency, a sense of life or death. One section of the manuscript stands out. In fact, it's revolutionary. It's a passionate appeal for the right of Scotland to exist with its choice of king, but with strings attached. It says the people are in charge, and if the king doesn't do what they want, the people have the right to remove him. That was quite a new idea in medieval times, because a lot of countries at that time were just kind of absolute monarchies and the monarchs ruled and did whatever they liked. But now the Scots were thinking, actually, this idea of nationhood is about all of us, and we all have a, have a share in that idea. Historians debate this, this, how much the people are involved. But frankly, Bruce would not have got to where he was had he not the complete support of a huge number of the people. People in Scotland were sick of war. They were sick of what they saw as English oppression and basically a colonial movement to destroy the place. They wanted someone who could defend them. The Bruce could, they recognised that. His victories helped cleanse him of that excommunication. So they no longer saw him just as a usurper and a murderer. They saw him as actually an effective king to get out of this. So the declaration, it could be argued, does summarise that fact that Bruce did have enough support to win these battles and to be king. He wasn't universally loved at all, so I think the declaration's line about every one of us supports this man is a massive stretch, but he had enough of the people on side and he couldn't have ruled without the people. worded manuscript is completed and sealed by Scotland's barons. What would one day become Scotland's most valuable historic document is duly dispatched. It went first by sea, landing in France for a potentially perilous journey, weeks on the road and no modern navigational aids to help.
The Pope sent several letters in reply and appointed a new Bishop of Glasgow who backed Bruce. It was the early sign Bruce needed. The declaration had been a success. It was the declaration of our growth where you see the Pope start to swither. Like before that, 1319, the Pope is very much on the side of English overlordship over Scotland. That's the direction things are moving. The declaration arrives. Shortly thereafter, the Pope sends a letter to the King of England using phrases he's cut and pasted. Fay the declaration. It's obviously got right into his heat, and that's brilliant. It's still another few years before Scotland gets officially recognised as independent, but that is the thing that turns the tide. The first thing that the Pope did was to suspend the interdict, the one that was going to suspend all, all Scottish civil life, um, so for a temporary period. It wasn't until 1324 that the Pope recognised Robert Bruce as king, which was obviously very significant. But you could perhaps argue that the declaration started to sow the seeds of, of the rights of Scotland to be independent and Bruce um, to lead. The voice of the people had been heard, though ironically, most Scots knew nothing about it. It was years before the Declaration of Arbroath became well known in its own home country. King Robert's plea to the Pope brought 400 years of relative peace before the Jacobites rose again to contest the kingship of Scotland in the campaign that ended at Culloden. It was maintained in, in manuscript form right through the Middle Ages. So any histories of Scotland that were written in that period usually included the Declaration of Arbroath. The Scotty Chronicon is a famous, a famous example of it. And it, it existed in several manuscript forms. So the educated class would have known about it. But it's really not until it's printed eh, and published in English towards the end of the 17th century, I think it's 1689, it's first printed in Latin, then printed in English. And it then becomes an active document in discussions about Scottish nationhood. And as we approached 1707 and the discussions over union, it becomes highly important in that charged atmosphere. It was years before the Declaration gained popular recognition for its historic role in Scotland's story, but its core idea that a nation is its people has been adopted by writers and thinkers across the world. It may even have influenced the men who drafted the American Declaration of Independence nearly 450 years later. The Declaration of Arbroath was published in about something between 40 and 50 books in the years leading up to the Declaration of American Independence. So although there is no direct link, you can surmise that they definitely would have read these books. There's strong circumstantial evidence that the Declaration of Arbroath would have been read by the people who created the Declaration of American Independence. The key idea in, in the Declaration is one that has increasing resonance through time. As we become um, more democratic, as we become more nationalistic, or you know, that, that nation states become more defined and, and everybody subscribes to the view that the state is who they are. I'm a Scot, or I'm a Brit, or I'm French, or whatever. So I think that almost the declaration grows in its resonance in to, to people. It has become associated with the, the, the Declaration of Independence in America. I don't think there's any historical evidence that there's a direct, direct connection, but the Americans believe it and perhaps that's what matters. It's certainly no coincidence that Tartan Day, a celebration of Scots heritage across the whole of North America, is held on April the 6th the day the declaration was dispatched, a fact recorded by the US Senate. This is from US Senate Resolution 155, March 20, 1998. April 6 has a special significance for all Americans, and especially those Americans of Scottish descent, because the Declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish Declaration of Independence, was signed on April 6, 1320 and the American Declaration of Independence was modelled on that inspirational document. So, 
we can have qualifications over how accurate that is, but in America, that's the core of their belief as Scots Americans. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the Declaration of Arbroath was celebrated by scholars, but still poorly recognised beyond. Several manuscript copies were made by the monks, but only one part damaged original copy remains. It was 1920 before Civic Scotland first acknowledged the anniversary, 600 years after its birth. By then, it had started to become a contentious icon for Scottish independence. Remember that 1920 was the height of the empire, and so the idea of um, self-government that is apparent in the Declaration doesn't entirely fit with an idea of empire. So it was really interesting to see how they tried to combine those two ideas in quite a convoluted way. Um, so for example, the moderator of the Church of Scotland is there and he stands up and says, in medieval Scotland, Scots won their independence through their robust character and now they were contributing this robustness towards the empire. Um, which I suppose is one way of looking at it. But then the moderator of the United Free Church of Scotland stands up and says something different. The real message is that all nations, no matter how small, have a natural and human right to self-government. Um, so that's quite a bold thing to say at the height of empire. Um, and. So it's quite interesting that even as far back as 1920, people were beginning to dispute what the Declaration really means in a modern context and what people should take away from it. And that to me just goes to show how powerful the document is. After 700 years, the words of the Declaration of our Arbroath still inspire its core ideas, its evocative sentiments about freedom, liberty, and the right of any nation to self-determination still resonate around the world. And I mean, they are beautiful words. I think we, f we forget that, don't we? That, you know, some of it is just mundane, you know, this is the history of Scotland, and some of it is very political, uh, but some of it is absolutely beautiful. And of course, you can buy a T-shirt with it on it, and many of us probably have. And I had the poster on my wall when I was younger. And um, you, a lot of Scots can quote the, for so long as a hundred of us um, speech, you know, that bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is an icon of Scottish identity, and I think quite rightly so. Scottish history has been so... Um, misunderstood and misused for the last hundred years because it's been seen as dangerous. It's been caught between unionism and nationalism and there's been a desire not to have too much structure to it, just a few big headlines. So you get things like William Wallace, brilliant, Bannockburn, Mary Queen of Scots, but none of it really makes any sense when you put it all together. So now we're starting to really dig down into what made Scotland emerge and the Declaration of our Broth is absolutely as important, if not more important, than Bannockburn in the nation's story. Iconic, but almost overlooked in its 700th year. With celebrations cancelled by the COVID-19 lockdown, at least there will now be one lasting memorial in this tapestry. I think we've got it all so we've, we're allowed a little bit of space here. Yeah. It took the Red Lichty stitching group of Angus women two years to complete this exquisite new design by Andy Crummy, inspired by the Declaration of Arbroath, a low-key labour of love. The curve is just slightly different, really, so we've, we've, it's, it's a space there and space here, but it's not quite dropping in, so we'll have to do a little bit of adjustment on this, take a little bit out of that rebate. Yeah, yeah, I think as long as we get the gap even. I yeah, think we, when we get an even gap, we'll thing. put in a little bit of perspex space in right. again just to space it out. If we can cut some of the thinner, the actual side perspex. The frame even includes a piece of oak 700 years old from Robert the Bruce's former estate. Although the majority of the oak in that tree is probably 150 years old, really, we have a, a few sections of it which are about seven or 800 years old, really, instead of a, and some say it could have been sort of <laughs> touched by Robert himself, really. But it's really nice to have that sort of idea of the whole thing, you know, from the cabinet and the stitching all coming together into one piece. 
to go to the Appian Tiger, really. <laughs> Most Holy Father, we know, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, we find that among other famous nations, our own, the Scots, has been graced with widespread renown. In their kingdom reigned 113 kings of their own royal stock, the line unbroken by a single foreigner. The Britons, they drove out first. The Picts, it utterly destroyed. May it please ye to admonish and exhort a king of English, who ought to be satisfied with what belongs to him, since England used once to be enough for seven kings or more. And how much will it tarnish your holiness memory, if, which God forbid, the church suffers eclipse or scandal in any branch of it during your time? But if your holiness put too much faith in the tales the English tell, and will not give sincere belief to all this, nor refrain from favouring them to our own undoing, then the slaughter of bodies, the perdition of souls, and all the other misfortunes that will follow, inflicted by them on us, and by us on them, will, we believe, be surely laid by the Most High, at your charge. For as long as a hundred of us remain alive, never will we on any conditions be subjected to the lordship of the English. It is in truth, not for glory, nor riches, nor honours that we fight, but for freedom alone. Which no honest man gives up, but with life itself.